Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. So a 70-something and a 20-something were sitting together, and the 20-something on the devices, and I said, you know, we have computers everywhere, high-speed processing, high-speed internet, we're connected to everything, we have easy air travel all over the world, we've been to space, all this stuff in my lifetime, what did you do when you were a kid without it? You had all that time, what did you do? And the 70-something said, we invented all that stuff. <laughs> And the part that follows on that is, what are you going to do? <laughs> What's your generation going to do? You see, we are in the midst of a generational shift. We always are. Um, but it's always good to kind of see that. Uh, but it's happening at every level but in our families. You probably saw that with your families coming together, that maybe grandma is not doing as much as she used to. The, the next generation is stepping up, things like that. And we're definitely in one here in this church. We, uh, you know, I'm a new senior minister, been here less than a year and a half, and um, following Reverend Howard Caesar for 34 years. That, that's a generational shift. And there was one from Sig Paulson to Howard Caesar as well. These are natural and they're good. And at every generational shift, we get the opportunity to see what's needed now, right? And so the problems that each generation faces, the problems that the generations face, they become the architects of the solution. This comes from Don Beck, who the creator of the Sprout Dynamics. It's a, a way of looking at the evolution of human consciousness through particular stages of development. And he says that the problem is the architect of the solution. Do you get that? Think about that for your own life. In the past where you had a problem, you needed a solution. The problem showed you just what you needed, did it not? Showed you just whether it was addiction, you knew the problem, the, the solution was recovery. But the problem showed you the need, whatever that is. And that is a beautiful way to think about evolution so that these, the problems that each generation face, they're not wrong, they're not bad, that's just, that's what we have. And so if you think about it, the, uh, the industrial age was was a solution to how do we feed the people? How do we mechanize farming? And it was great. It was a brilliant solution that we could get so much more food to so many more people. And yet it caused a lot of problems. The pollution, the, uh, the, use, the overuse of the, earth, the Earth's resources. And then that's the new problem. And guess what? That too calls forward a new solution. And so about a year ago, we... Um, just after I had gotten this position, we, we decided it's time for us to ask, who are we now? And why are we here? That's the talk title today. Why are we here? It's a great question to ask. What is it now? And so we began to talk about it in two ways. He said, what is essential to unity and what's needed now? As a community, as a church, what do we, what do we not want to lose? Because this is who we are. It's our identity. This is our, this is our game. And what are the ways that we need to shift and, and pivot and respond in a different way to what's needed now? So we began this process by, um, first of all, I just asked people to answer those two questions. I said, what's, what's essential? What's needed now? And I got a bunch of emails and brilliant, brilliant things. And themes began to emerge. And then last January, we created a church-wide survey a year ago. And we launched that. We had about 700 people complete it gave us some real information. Three things emerged from that survey. A request from you, the community, that this is what we should focus on. We should focus on youth and families. See, people are thinking generationally. We have to think about not just who's here now, but how do we attract the young families that come in to, re to replace y'all? <laughs> how do we do that when the time comes? How do we make sure that we have all the support we need for our youth and family? The second was our unity teachings. This is essential to us, that we not not be unity, that we focus on what is our teaching in the world, the uniqueness that we bring. 
And the third, and this is, those were the two things I thought were really interesting and sort of like that's what we are, that's important. Then the third was kind of a shift. It was a greater emphasis on connection and community. I think that that has been being asked for for a while. Um, what worked in the 80s to make this church successful and prosperous doesn't work as well anymore because we are now living in the AO era after Oprah. <laughs> Did you know that? Because it used to be that if you wanted these teachings, you had to come to a unity church. That was, we had exclusive content and an exclusive delivery system. This is where you got it. But then Oprah came along and she had Deepak and uh, Gary Zukov and all these great spiritual teachers on her show. And then we also have the AA era, the after Amazon. So you no longer had to come to our church to get the books in the bookstore. They're available to all people everywhere, all the time, digitally, instantly. And so what that's led to is uh, we have a different opportunity. How do we serve now? What's being asked of us now as the unity of Houston? And what those of us who've been thinking about this and talking about this, praying about this, visioning about this, we've, we've come to see that the wisdom was already here in our community. This, it's this call to greater experience of community and belonging because you can't get that in your house, on your computer. So after we did the survey, the next thing we did in May, we created a church-wide visioning. We had people come and we did a process created by Dr. Michael Beckwith from Agape in LA where we did visioning. We simply opened our intuition and asked God to show us what the vision is. These themes were confirmed in that process. The next thing we did is we had, um, I had asked Dr. Jean Ladding to to help us in re recreating our guiding words. And so she, along with Stephanie Foy and Amy Hageman, they created a series of workshops for our leadership, our board of directors, our staff, our volunteer team leaders, people like that. And we had these workshops where we, we I think we identified 13 areas, and we all cre we created three sets of 13 statements. So we had 39 statements, if my math is correct, it's not my strong suit, that said this is who we are, this is what's important. And then from there, we had a drafting committee guided by um, Cindy Wigglesworth, who has done a lot of work like this. Um, she was helping uh, Methodist healthcare system create their eye care system. She's brilliant and just one of our community members. And she did. She guided us through this. And the drafting committee, we came down to one purpose statement and three value statement that we hope encompass who we are, what's essential, and challenge us to be the architects, to, um, to allow the problems to be the architects of our solution as we move forward into the next century. So for the next four weeks, starting today, I'm gonna to be offering a series on our purpose statement and our three values statement, because I think it's, it's gonna be fun and helpful for us to kind of see who we are right now, to see what it is that's being asked of us individually and collectively so that we can ensure the health and vitality of this church. We are celebrating 100 years of being in Houston. Did you know that? 100 years this year. That's right. Well, one of the things that, that I really have come to see is that, as I mentioned, we can't, we can't get, we can get to the teaching, but we can't get the community as well in the online or format. But with the advent of connection through the internet and through technology and media, I believe that we are the most connected and the most isolated generation ever on this planet. While if something happens on the other side of the world, we know about it immediately, and we may send a prayer, a donation, we feel like we're there, we're connecting, we're helping. Loneliness is an epidemic, that people are spending so much time in isolation. And so the thing I believe that we can offer here, which you can't get any other way, is this coming together, the energy of gathering in person, the energy of connection, of sharing as we walk along our spiritual path. And so this is our purpose statement. I want to share this with you. As a matter of fact, can we read it together? In community, we nurture and empower each other, transforming our lives that we may serve the world. And I want to break this down into three parts today. I love giving a three-point sermon, and this worked so beautifully. In community, we nurture and empower each other. Let's look at that for just a moment. 
As I said, you can get this teaching, you can get these principles, you can read these books without ever having to come to a Unity Church. And true, they work. You can simply practice affirmative prayer, you can simply do your meditation, your vision work, and you can use the principles that we teach to create and manifest your life exactly the way you want it without ever telling a single soul about it. And yet, there is something about the shared journey that is powerful, that is rich, that is healing. For those of us who are in recovery, we have a similar concept that in um, the 12-step tradition, there is the, there is the principles and there is the, the fellowship. And so there's, we could do it all alone, but there's something about doing it together that is so powerful. So what does it mean to nurture and empower each other? The way it works for me is when I forget the truth, somebody remembers for me. When I get locked into the hypnosis of my false belief and error thinking, whether that be lack, not an, it's always some form of not enough, right? Like, I'm not something enough. I can get locked into that thought, and I will have people in my spiritual community who will put their arms around me and remember for me the truth that I am an expression of God's own being. The light and the love and the power of God are in me, right where I am. And when we get to see other people who have overcome where their stumbling block became their stepping stone, how encouraging is that? And when someone else is struggling with a particular issue and they share their experience and strength and hope and it gives you a new insight, a new way of holding it, how powerful is that? This is what I believe that we can offer in so many different ways, at so many different levels. It's great for us to gather with hundreds of us here on a Sunday morning and celebrate spiritual community and get those hugs. And absolutely, as a matter of fact, we want to grow this too. We want this to be the biggest front door to our church. We want everyone in Houston to know this is the place to be on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And if we can find ways where you can get in a circle like what Rose is creating, like our small, small group spirit group. So if you can be in a class with Jean Marie and you can really begin to talk and be seen and witnessed on your journey, that is so powerful. There's a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King I'd like to share with you. This, he was asked, what is the end game of the civil rights movement? What are we trying to accomplish here? And this is what he said. The end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this type of understanding goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men and women. Amen? The beloved community. An idea where we come together and our, our diversity is not divisiveness. It is our strength where we are unity, but we are not uniformity in that unity, that we celebrate the differences that everyone brings to the journey. And we are strengthened, we are uplifted by it. The second part of this, transforming our lives. Transforming our, this is really our game in unity. You may not know this, but we are known as a wealth and success church. I got no problem with that, how about you? Pearl Bailey, the great Pearl Bailey, she said, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. <laughs> there is something about we, we need to have our lives work. That we need to be able to demonstrate and manifest all that we need for a sufficient life so that, well, I'll get to the so in a moment. But this is part of our journey. And this, so the question that comes up for me is that, is our unity community, is it, an, is it an I thing or is it a we thing? Is it a me thing or a we thing? It's both. But if we miss the me part, we're missing something really important. Because the personal transformation is global. 
We can't change the world unless we change the individual. Amen? And, yeah, I mentioned we're wealth and success, but did I also mention that the corollary to that is that we are about personal responsibility? That you are co-creating your reality with God every moment, all of it. You're responsible. I am responsible. I've shared many times that the first time I heard that in New Thought Church, I did not want to be that responsible. I preferred to blame others for my misery. That was a lot more comfortable for me. And there were plenty of people for the blame. Share that blame around. All the, I could give you all the reasons on why my life didn't work. But deep down, I knew that it was me. And it was wrapped in shame, in lack. And what I was taught here is that there's no need for the shame. It's not serving anybody. But instead, if I would just take responsibility for my circumstances, take responsibility for my thinking which is how we interact with the law of cause and effect, that I could begin to reshape my life in a way that was a better fit for the expression of God that I am. It works. And it is necessary, it is vital that we each do our own personal work of healing and recovery. There is no substitute for it. And this does not come by singing a great song with Ken Gale and Julia Laskowski on Sunday morning. I'm sorry. That is not enough. This is celebration, but you have to do the practice. You have to do the practice of it. And the practices in unity, there are many. Affirmation and denial are our chief ones. Affirmative prayer. Meditation, hugely important. We do, we do these things alone and together. But it's really important that we, if we are to transform our lives... We do that ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to what end? If we are a wealth and success church, why? Is it just so we can get wealthier and more successfuler? I don't think so. There's got to be a purpose to it. Like, what, what could it be? Kathy Hearn is a dear friend and a teacher. She says that when we heal something in our own consciousness, some old false belief, we heal it not only for ourselves, but for all people, past and future. And this brings us to the last piece, that we may serve the world. Your healing, your ability to achieve a life of success and enough and abundance, it's so that you can give your gift more freely into the world and help others. And when a people would tell me this, I used to think that means I've got to go be Mother Teresa. The truth is, that job was already taken. She did that beautifully. That was her, her path. She felt such a calling to serve the poor, the forgotten people of Calcutta, that, that she devoted her whole life. And she is one of my spiritual exemplars. She shows me what it looks like to fully commit yourself to the calling to be of service in the world. But that's not my calling, and it's not your calling. It doesn't have to be as grand, or it doesn't have to be, not that that's grand, it doesn't have to be, well, it's just going to be what it is for you. And the truth is, it's just being who you are. That when we heal, when we do that transformational work of the personal, it reveals how we are to give that gift into the world. And it's, it's a journey. It's not, you know, the, my friend Sheila McKeithen, who is a minister in Kingston, Jamaica, at a New Thought Church, I heard her speak one time at Michael Beckwith's conference in L.A., and she said, everybody has a call in their life. Some people have a David call, and some people have a Moses call. The David call is that um, David, the son of Jesse, was anointed as a young teenager to be the next king of Israel by Samuel the priest, and that's exactly what happened. It was all laid out. He knew it. He did it. Boom. And some people get a Moses call where God's like, uh, come here, go talk to Pharaoh for me, would you? <laughs> that step was revealed and then the next step and the next step and the next step. And that's how most of our callings work. We do the healing work that is ours to do. It reveals the next step and the next and the next. And then pretty soon you're senior minister of unity of Houston. I don't know how the heck that happens. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. I don't know. 
This past week, I had a coaching session. I have a wonderful executive coach that I rely on. I, but I want to say this, too, about doing this, this work in community. I was taught in 12 Steps, but it's always good to have one ahead of you and one behind you. That we should be being mentored and, and guided by someone who is further along the journey than we are, and we should be looking back to help somebody who needs our guidance and our help. And no matter where you are in your journey, that can be true for you. That's true for you. So the one I was working with, my coach, um, she was really asking me to think about, because I want to grow this church. I want to see how we can expand this ministry and at every level in all ways of effectiveness and power and connection. And, and she's, she's invited me so many times to just think about who are the people that want to come to Unity now? Who are those people? And so we've been describing and just sort of brainstorming and thinking about them. And what I realized is that I'm thinking about the people that are already here, that are just lit up, that are vital, that are active, that are stepping into leadership, uh, like these three blonde goddesses here on the front row today. I'm about to introduce the third one in a moment. They have three things in common that I've noticed. They have a commitment and a value on community. They have a deep commitment to their own personal work of healing and recovery, if it is recovery. And third is that they have a desire to be of service in the world. I'd like to introduce to you Exhibit A, Ms. Amy Hageman. <laughs> Mrs. Amy Hageman. Where did I put that microphone? Hi. <laughs> I forgot where I left my microphone. Amy Hageman is, uh, she's not new to our community. As a matter of fact, she was christened here. But she has been a vital part of this process of creating our guiding words, our purpose and value statements. So I just wanted her to come up and share some of her experience of how this has been for her. So go. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so from a process perspective, um, I've been really fortunate to be involved from the very beginning. Um, my mom, Stephanie Foy, was involved in the survey. And because of Hurricane Harvey, she happened to be living with me. So I got to be really hands-on in the survey. I helped facilitate the, um, some of the breakout sessions. I attended the Michael Beckwith session, the visioning session. And then I got to be part of the drafting committee. And so I got to see thousands and thousands and thousands of words that we all wrote about our dream for this church and this community. And I just have to say, our experience was that people are alive with vision mm -hmm. for the way forward. There's so much energy in what we all said is already here and is going well and where we're called to be. And that was just really exciting. And somewhere along the way, I had a huge aha moment. Um, you know, Michael talked a lot about community already and as we were digging through those words, I just kept thinking, yeah, that's nice. Like, <laughs> that's for other people. Other people need community. I'm really close with my family. I come on Sundays, I hear the message and I leave. And that, that just was never what I was called to. Um, and then one Sunday, before we'd gotten the words down, figured out, I was sitting and there had been a really powerful message and a powerful song. And I realized that a woman across the church from me um, was sitting by herself and was crying. And I thought, someone needs to go and comfort her, Who's nurture do that? and empower her. <laughs> and, and, I, and I literally was waiting for somebody else to go and do it. And then it, it all just hit me at once that that was mine to do. Yeah. And, you know, I had been we'd been looking at these words over and over again. And every time I saw the word community, I kept thinking that's nice for other people as if it had nothing to do with me. Wow. Um, and then when I saw that woman, I realized, no, I have to live these values if the church is ever going to get there. Yeah. And I also realized, you know, prior to this process where Michael invited us all in. Yeah. So, so talk about that. That was the thing that really yeah. impacted me um, that you, you were talking about the, Growing up in this church, you have a unique perspective because most of us didn't. Amen. <laughs> How weird that would have been to grow up in a church that affirmed. Never mind. But most of us didn't arrive. Did, and so you have seen many purpose and mission statements yes. over the year. And share what you shared about that. So I think for un until the last few months, I won't even say full year. In the last few months, I always thought the statements, the purpose, the mission, the values, I couldn't have told you what they were. And that was the job of the office. <laughs> right. Whoever was in the office or the proverbial, some, like someone's gonna go comfort this woman. Obviously that needs to happen. It never really hit me that it was 
mine to do, yeah. that it was ours to do. And that Sunday, I sort of got it that we all have to deliver on that purpose statement for the church to go where we're going. And because of, you know, oneness, for the church to go where it's going, we are going as individuals where we're going. Yeah. And it, it just, it finally hit me. Yeah. Like, these statements are not for the church. It's not so to help Michael do his job better. These statements are for us to guide us as part of the greater community. Yeah. So when we finally landed on the final wording, um, Cindy and Terry, you'll remember that too, that we, this for the purpose statement, go ahead and bring it back up. Um, that would be great. Just we can look at it. Amy said something in the room that day. You know, she said, I've grown up in this church. I've seen, and exactly that, that I, this is always what the church was doing. And it was great. She said, this is the first time I feel like I'm in the center of it. And not because you were in the center of creating it, but as a member of this community, you're in the middle of this. Yeah, that's great. The thing I also love about uh, Jared and Amy Hageman is that they are growing our church one baby at a time. They are bringing new people to church by so congratulations. We <laughs> love you. Thank you. That was powerful. So they brought two people to church. How many of you brought? So, uh, well, one and a half. New baby Hageman will be here soon. So one of the things that Amy talked about, too, was that... Um, some of the words really felt like, oh, that's beautiful, it makes me feel really comforted and alive, and some of it is kind of challenging. Like, you know, how, that was probably difficult for you to go over and minister to that woman because you're not a minister, you're not on staff. I mean, there, and that's what I want to talk about for a moment is that the, the words, the guiding words, all of our statements are meant to inspire and challenge. They're meant to make us want, um, go, yes, that's who I am, and oh, I'm called to be more than I currently have embodied. And that's the way it's supposed to be because we're all growing, including your senior minister. We're definitely growing into this as we do it. The other thing I want to bring to um, mind is the idea that nobody is going to have to do it the same. As a matter of fact, I do want to read this from 1 Corinthians. This is, Paul had a similar situation. He was leading this new Jesus movement in the first century. And there was a church in Corinth. They had a lot of problems. And he was, people, there was a lot of ego involved. People were struggling for leadership and who was right and who was wrong. And he wrote this, this beautiful metaphor. He called it the body of Christ. And he says this, starting in verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of, body, of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and one body. And as we get into our belonging statement, we'll talk about that we are one body. That's where that comes from, that there is something unique that is necessary for each of us to bring, to just bring our willingness. Really, that's it. And if you're not willing, are you willing to be willing? <laughs> Can you just open a little bit to allow spirit to move through you to bring some new good into the world? We had our white stone ceremony on Wednesday. I was working out with my personal trainer, that morning, and he came to the service um, for Christmas Eve for the first time he'd ever been in the church. And, and uh, we were talking about, I told him, I was trying to get him to come back again. I was told him about the, the White Stone ceremony. It's like, it's where, you know, we get a word. We, how many were here at White, White Stone on Wednesday? Oh, quite a few. So it's a beautiful thing we do on the first Wednesday of the month every year. And it comes from an obscure verse in the Revelation, Book of Revelations, where it says, I will write a new name upon a white stone. And it's, it's a way that we take it up metaphysically is that we're given intuitively a word or a name that will guide us through the year. And so I'm talking to Luis about it, and he says, well, my word's success. I'm success. And he's 26, and he's building his business, and he just knew it. That's it. He's like, yeah. It's like, I get that, that. At 26, I probably would have been that too. But I've learned to think in a little bit longer time scales, and my hope is that I get to serve in this, in this role for a decade, for 15 years maybe, just to, so I can really do some good over the long term. And if that's not the path, I'm really, I surrender. I accept whatever God has in mind here. So it's like I was thinking about, I want to be of use and of, I want to be good and in this job. And so I was thinking, I want diligence. I want perseverance. I want patience. No, I don't want patience as my word for the year. I don't want that. 
because you will be given many opportunities to experience and express patience. But all day long I was thinking about it and then the word strength kept coming. Yeah, I need to be strong for the long haul. I want strength, I want strength. And then on Wednesday night in the service, I'm, I'm actually at the piano. Jean Marie is leading the meditation. We get to the place where we go into the silence and we hear our name and I'm like, strength, joy. <laughs> no, it's strength, strength, joy. It's like, no, I've already figured it out. I don't know what you're playing at, God, but I, joy is not going to help here. I need strength. And then from somewhere, Bible school, something in there, I remember, I think it's from the Psalms. I didn't even look it up this morning. I remember the Bible verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. And this is what I want to leave you with. To serve the world is not about suffering. And it's not about struggle, and it's not about crawling wounded on your knees. It is about joy. It's giving from fullness. It's giving to receptivity. It is joyful. And that's where our strength comes from. So I hope that you feel some sense of invitation and inspiration from this. And come back the next three weeks. We're going to go into more of... Not everyone needs a spiritual community. I'll just say that. But a lot more people need it than know they need it. <laughs> and you may think, I don't know if I want to get involved in that crazy church over there on Unity. But I invite you to come at least the next three Sundays and just determine whether or not there may be actually something in this community that will light up your joy, that will free you up to give your gift in a way that not only will bring you fulfillment, and the truth is we think we want success and, success and happiness, those are byproducts of fulfillment. And fulfillment is when we are free to give our gift, have it beautifully received, and we know we've done what we've came here to do. Something is happening here, y'all. <laughs> Can you feel it? There is a quickening. There's an alivening. And we're all invited to be a part of it. If no one has told you today they love you, I love you. You are precious. You are amazing. You are necessary. God bless you. Thank you, Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.